we will be going over one of my games actually. And it's a very interesting game. It's played against Grandmaster Yuri Shulman uh, in 2010. I'm playing with the white pieces this game. So I play d4, d5, c4, e6. Go knight c3, and now he played c6. Do you know why he decided to play uh, this setup with the e6 move first? See, because looks like he could have also just played d4, d5, right? c4, e6, c6, and knight c3, and then e6. But if he plays this way, what additional lines I can play against this setup? that I cannot play against if he plays with, for example, in this position, this move, like I cannot really take on d5 here because then he just takes back. Could you play by g5? No, uh, no, 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 in this position, for example, I cannot take c takes d5. But let's say if he plays c6, I have the option of playing c takes d5, the exchange variation of the slav. It's not like it's something that, you know, black really needs to worry about, but if the player has black doesn't really play these positions, you know, he might feel a little bit uncomfortable going into the Slav exchange if he doesn't know the, all the lines up to date. So that's why Yuri plays this way with e6 in order to avoid the exchange Slav lines. So we know each other very well, so we even played a match. So <coughs> we played lots of games against each other, so we know our the openings. <coughs> so he plays c6. But Against this setup now, of course, I can just play e3 in this position, which will be the you know, normal e3, knight f3. But in this game, I decided to play the sharp e4. This move leads into to a pawn sacrifice, but I had some preparation. And in fact, it was fun that we actually prepared together some of these lines. Mm -hmm. So uh, he knew it very well also. You know, I was coaching the team in 2010 at the Olympiad and uh, I was not playing so he actually won a game with black against a strong player but uh, I decided to give it a try I don't normally play this move e4 so this was I think the first time that I decided to play so I play e4 now line goes d takes e4 knight takes e4 and bishop b4 check and here basically white needs to play bishop d2, which is the main line, but also knight c3 move is played a couple of times. I've seen maybe a lot of times actually played, but uh, the game I can remember, uh, in fact, uh, Grandmaster Alex Yermolinsky, he played knight c3 against Yuri Schumann. So there was a game played with that move, but I don't quite believe that you can really fight for advantage with going back with a knight. So that's why I didn't play that. So my plan was to play bishop d2. So I went bishop d2. And now, if he just takes bishop d2 after queen d2, white is slightly better. I have the control of the center, a little bit more development, and the problem is this bishop on c8. So bishop d2, it's bad, so this is the line. So he goes, queen takes d4. Now he's winning the pawn. So he goes, queen takes d4, and now my knight is hanging. So I will take the bishop. Bishop takes b4, and now he plays He plays queen, takes e4, check. So this is a very sharp line, and there are many games played in this opening. So now black is up a pawn, but his dark squares are a little bit weak, and white has the pair of the bishops. So it's, it, this position side depends on a player. Some players really like to play this position, and some players really don't like. So it depends how much you really analyze this position so but it's very sharp so all three results possible here so there, there have been some games where black won in 20 moves 25 moves and white won many games so I decided to go now bishop e2 okay my idea to go bishop e2 and he played knight a6 and here white has couple of options you can play bishop d6 
one of the main moves. Bishop a5 is the move that I played. There is also uh, this bishop f8 move here, actually. Because <laughs> it's, a, it's a funny move. You cannot take because queen d8 may. <coughs> so, uh, but uh, I don't think it really does much here because it looks like queen e5. And so queen e5 just protects this. So, but my idea was that uh, I said, OK, if you replace this line, I will play bishop here. So I play bishop a5. Well, I'm just threatening mate. Queen takes d8 mate. And here, he played f6. And uh, another move here is b6 that he can also try in this position. So when I was preparing, I wasn't so sure which line he's going to play. He's going to play f6. Uh, b6 or f6. But I remember that f6 in you know my analysis was like, you know, maybe this is a little bit you know dubious because you know it's weakening the position. So he played f6. Now I just play knight f3. Uh, my idea is just to simply to develop and castle. And then after f6, there will be some weaknesses. I was hoping that I will have some compensation. And since I have also the bishops, so I felt okay. I can do something. So he played b6. And now I want you to think about it. Because <coughs> here you're going to see um, lots of in-between moves. And these are the moves that you know sometimes we don't look for. We're thinking of opponent makes a move attacking our piece. And we think immediately, oh, we have to move it. But not always you have to think like that. Sometimes you have to look for in-between moves. Like in this position, I didn't move my bishop. Can you find the move that I played here? So what I want to do is I want to try to create some more weaknesses. As you can see, he has pushed some of his pawns. If I can you know, force him at least to play g6 again, this will be weakening additionally the position. So what can you do here? Well, your bishop is hanging. So you have to make a move that is attacking something instead of just moving. Which piece do you think you can attack here? Queen. queen, right? So can we find a good move to attack his queen here? Knight d2. Absolutely. We go knight to d2, and now attack his queen. He cannot take the pawn. Why? Why can't he take the pawn on g2? Well, no, no, this pawn on g2. Oh, okay. If he goes queen takes g2, he's losing. Bishop f3, Bishop f3 attack the queen, and then check here, pick up the rook. So he cannot take on g2, we know that now. So he cannot play that. So he needs to move the queen again. And as you can see now, he's moving his queen a lot. So the more he moves his queen, it's better for me. That means he's not developing his pieces. But again, this is a very concrete position. Now he goes queen f4. Now, see, I'm still not moving my bishop here, because now I have an opportunity to create some more weaknesses. What can you do to create some more weaknesses now? Black's position here. Bishop check, bishop check absolutely. <coughs> now, he played g6, blocking it. And now, suddenly, I have my both bishops, as you can see, on the side of the board. And they're both hanging. But now, which move I can play now to attack something? Take the, take the queen. Well, bishop f3. bishop f3, yes. Now I go back bishop f3. See, I could have gone bishop f3 first, but it's, m it's better for me to induce this g6 move because it's going to be weakening. So I go bishop f3 now. I want to take on c6 check, and then pick up the rook. See, I'm not too worried about my bishop yet here. I mean, all this was my preparation during the game. It's not like I played all this move. But you know, it's, it's very interesting ideas that you, you weaken the position. And then you come back, you attack on c6. So he has to do now something after bishop f3. And he played knight 
He played knight e7. He protected it, so at this point, I will bring my bishop back. See, it's much better for me with the bishop on c3, the pawn is on g6 than on g7. On g7, it would have been protected. But on g6 now, I have some more pressure. So he needs to protect this. So bishop c3, castle, castle. So now, in this position, He decided to bring his queen back because queen is vulnerable. Again, I can play g3. So he decided to bring it back. And now I want you to spend some time here, maybe two, three minutes. And I would like you to think about this position and evaluate it. Okay? So let's say, who you think is better here? Black is up a pawn, but he's got these <coughs> funny pawns here a little bit. and. <coughs> Development. So, w w what's the evaluation of this position? What do you think here? Is it white is better, black is better, or equal? What do you think here? And what would be the best continuation also for white? So, you need to evaluate the position and also find the best follow up. That, that's the move I played, yes. And what would be the evaluation of this position? <coughs> who, who is better here? White, black, and why? White is better. White is better, uh-huh. Two bishops. Two bishops. Yeah. Black skin position is bad. Bad, a little bit weak. What else? Black bishop on C8 is so Uh-huh. What else we can mention about knights on the edge? Knights on the edge. Mm -hmm. Pawns with a lot of control. A lot of pawn moves has been played. A lot of queen moves has been played, right? And who has the lead in development? White. White, right? So if you comp if you add all these factors, it's very it's pretty clear now in this position that you want to play as white because you have two bishops lead in development. His pawn structure is kind of weak, and weak squares, weak pawns, and knight is on the side. So black needs a lot of moves here to coordinate his position here. Even though he's got an extra pawn, but you know he can only convert the extra pawn in the end game. Right now he has lots of fighting problems here. And the move is, of course, knight e4. Activating the knight, centralizing it, and also immediately attacking on f6. And now. He needs to find the only move, which is e5, of course, to block the bishop. And now, it looks like, okay, what's next now? What can I do? Because if I play slowly, then he will develop his pieces, and he will coordinate, and he will be fine. But now you need to make a, another move and create a threat. So can you find this move here? Every move I make, I try to create some threats. So which move would be the best? <coughs> Alex. Excellent. Excellent. See, I simply develop another piece here. And now the threat is, let's just see. If, let's say he moves the bishop here. Losing already because of knight takes f6. Check. Again, do you see why I forced him to play g6? Because I wanted him not to you know, have this pawn weak. So takes, bishop e5 takes, attacking the rook. And the queen. So, so now winning the rook and it's losing now. So, so when I played this move, rook e1, uh, I'm creating a threat of knight f6, and the good thing is I'm also developing a piece. Since I'm creating a threat, that means he cannot just normally develop his pieces because he needs to worry about my threat. And now he found, uh, I think it's one of the only moves he has here, actually, because I'm not sure if he can do anything else here. So he played queen d7. 
But again, moving the queen. So let's count how many times the queen moved. One, two, three, four, five. Lots of queen moves. I mean, this is the kind of, th the opening is like that. You move a lot, but still. Five moves with the queen, lots of pawn moves, and some development. So it looks at least risky, this position for black. Okay, now queen d7. Now, the question for you, do I want to go to endgame here? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> okay. Think about it. Do you want to go to endgame here when you're down a pawn? No, right? And a position like this, you want to make sure you keep the queens on the board because you can try to attack. Now, again, you make a move and create a threat. So remember, you have to always make some moves and create threats. And actually, very logical moves the next few moves. It's <coughs> Queen b3, you could, but you know I'm more want to be closer to this, this side, center, and not to go to the queen side. Yes. Knight f6 here, but now it's not so clear because he can just take. Because he already moved his queen, so I won't be able to take with the tempo on e5. So what else? I don't want to exchange the queens, okay? You don't, queen c2? Is that the best square for the queen here? Any king side. Don't want to go away. You're going away, you know. I want to be <coughs> closer here. Queen to e2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you, you have to make a move and create a threat. But you have to see the threat so you know which move to make here. Who can tell me what is the threat after queen e2? What am I trying to do here? Take, take f6 pawn. Excellent. I'm threatening to take on f6. He takes back with this. And after queen e5, game is over. Because he cannot protect the f6 and he cannot defend the diagonal. Okay, remember this is diagonal, yeah? Battery we have. And now if the rook moves, we have a checkmate from g7 and h8, so <coughs> it's losing. So again, developing and creating threats. So now he needs to again spend some time to defend against that threat. So now he plays queen e2, queen e6, defending the threat, only move. And now, what will be the most logical move? in this position. What do you think here? And you still want to continue. A rook to D1. Absolutely. A rook to D1, and again creating a threat. And what is the threat? Do you see the threat? Absolutely. Rook comes to D6. It will be over because I take on F6 and break through. I have excellent development. And basically, Buck is barely hanging on here. But it's not so easy here, because now he found, again, good move. Knight f5, and he's controlling the d6 square. If he didn't have this move after rook d6, I think it's probably losing now. Now, we reach this position where, OK, I developed all my pieces. They're very nice. They're centralized. But I'm still down a pawn. And I can't really do anything right now. So when you look at this position, now you think of can you gain some more space and possibly create some threats in this position? And remember, we, we focus on this diagonal, but we also have another bishop on this diagonal. And this is very important, too. What can you do to create some more space? <coughs> Push pawns. Which pawns? B4. B4. Very good. We go b4 now, gaining more space. And now, with some potential threats of b5. OK? And now, in this position, he played, after I played before, he played knight c7. The knight is on the side of the board, not doing anything. So he's trying. It's a logical move to bring into the game. 
And after he played knight c7, I spent some time here calculating what I can try to do and came up with this very interesting uh, sacrifice that will allow me to win a lot of pawns and the most important thing, I will open up the position. And when you have two bishops, you always want to open the position. Okay? <coughs> so... Aha, uh -huh, very good, very good. You sacrifice the knight. It's not like I'm winning, but I, the position is going to be open. And he doesn't have good development. Mm. So, how do we do that now? How do we do that here? Because, you know, if he goes 98, he may consolidate the position. What can you do here? Excellent. Excellent job. Knight takes f6. Sacrifice. Now, <coughs> because while he's not developed, if I'm going to do something like this, this is the right time. Because he doesn't have development. If he has more development, it will be more difficult. Knight takes f6. He went queen takes f6. Now we go. No, do, do, no, no, no. We don't want to exchange queens, right? Bishop takes e5. Now attacking the knight and the queen. So he goes queen to f7. Okay? So he goes queen to f7. And now, let's take the pawn on c6 too. Now let's look at this position. I'm down a piece, but I have two pawns. Very strong bishops, his king is exposed, and now I'm also attacking the rook. This is more than enough compensation for the piece. Okay? But still, it's not like I'm winning here. Bishop c6, he goes rook b8. What to do now? Because I need to find the right plan here, again. Take out the knight on c7. Queen takes? Oh, no, it's not. He moves away, yeah? So in a position like this, now you have to look at the position and see which piece. The way I found the next move, I just looked at the position and said, hmm, I know I have a good position, but how can I improve one of my pieces? And if you look at the position here, which piece do you think I'm trying to improve here? Very good. Queen, right? Because bishops are excellent. Rooks are perfect. So this is the piece that is kind of unclear. What is he doing here? Where do you want to put this queen? So you have some more threats. What do you think? Well, don't worry about c4 pawn because it's something... He, he needs to protect his knight. He, he doesn't have time to take that pawn. No worries about the c4 pawn right now. You could put on b2. I was thinking, I actually spent some time here because I had some ideas, maybe even pull the bishop back here and go queen b2. Some battery, but it wasn't so clear. So I don't want to put it on b2 because then this would be kind of not the most effective battery, you know, because... I wanted to have other way around, so I can go queen h8. This way, I don't know if I can do much. G4, in a position like this, you want to be very careful when you play g4. Because you have the control, you have the control almost the whole board, but when you play g4, then he goes knight h4, he's going to start threatening some threats. So he will have some threats. A qu queen g4. That's what yeah, well, oh, queen g4? No, queen g4 better, better. Something better you have. No, because g4 was actually an idea that I was considering in some positions. Yeah, in, uh, for the b4 move, actually, I was, I'll, let's talk about it later because the computer actually suggests g4 is a lot better. <laughs> Well, I actually, I actually thought about that before move. Definitely, I considered it before, but it's, it's not so clear. 
because yeah, it's see the thing is when you're playing a game, afterwards when you analyze, of course, computer will show you something weird. But during the game, G4, it's not this position earlier, okay? But uh, G4, it's it's good. I also analyze that later, but it's such a move that you know, a bit risky. I kind of like this position. You know, it's it's. I feel like I have more control here. No, no, we, we, we need to improve the queen. Yeah. Queen to e4. Well, you need to kind of keep your eye on this f2 pawn because. No, no. <laughs> I played queen d2. Okay. If you look at this position, can you find a good move for black? I mean, try to find a move for black that it's not losing something. <laughs> that's, that's the problem for black here. He just doesn't have a good move. How about bishop d7? Bishop b7 loses to bishop d7. This is a very important sequence, actually, because I go bishop d7, and he cannot protect this knight on c7. <coughs> And now I'm actually threatening to take the knight. And even if you take back with the rook, I go bishop e6 winning the queen. So that's the problem here. It's just basically, it's a strange position, but you know, he's got an extra piece, but he's, he's almost in Suxavank here. He has no good move here. So after queen d2, he found, I think, the, I think he found the only move again. Because I really can't see a move here for him that is not making his position worse. No, bishop to e6 loses. I take the knight, and then I take the bishop. Which knight? Well, you lose your rook. <laughs> so it's like, really, he's, uh, he's kind of pinned, you know, everywhere. So he played only move knight g7. Okay. Now he's putting some pressure. At least he's trying to do something. Now, at this point, I want to win an exchange, because I already have two pawns. If I win the exchange, I will, be, I will be ahead here. So how can I win the exchange here? I might be able to just continue playing positionally, just for compensation, but I felt like you know, if I can win the exchange you know, and I have two pawns, I also will have the material advantage. So how can I win the exchange here? How can you win this rook? Bishop to d5. Excellent. Now, threatening to win the queen, he doesn't have anything better but to take. Okay. Because, let's say he plays bishop e6. I go bishop takes c7, attacking the rook. So if he takes on d5, I can take on b8. He loses. If he takes with the queen, I simply take on e6 check. Knight captures, rook captures, and white will have two extra pawns and a winning position. So he cannot do that. So he took knight takes d5, and now we go bishop takes b8. And now still, I actually still have the initiative here because now his knight is still hanging, and his dark squares are very weak. Okay, now I have the I have up exchange and have two pawns, so I have a rook, five pawns, and two pawns. I have seven. And he has two pieces, so he has, is you know technically he's down a pawn, but also his position is very difficult now. So he goes knight f6. Now I bring my bishop into the game, bishop d6, attacking the rook. So he goes rook d8, and now he's pinning me. So I need to move my queen to a good square, so I'm no longer pinned, and also have some pressure on the dark squares. Which square would be the best here for white? You could go for, but then you have to worry about this knight jumping and attacking you. You want to put the queen somewhere that these knights are not annoying you with attacks all the time. Mm. 
Well, again, he goes knight f5 and he's attacking. Absolutely. Queen c3. Very good square, putting pressure on the diagonal. And at some point, I'm also planning to push the c pawn. Push, because I can create a pass pawn. So that's what I want to do. So he went knight f5, activating his knight, attacking the bishop. I simply go now bishop to e5, offering the exchange of the rooks. Exchange of the rooks will be useful for me because then he will have background problems also on top of uh, you know the weak diagonal. So that's why he, when I played bishop e5, he didn't want to exchange, so he played knight d7. But now he's spinning himself. So he's spinning himself, and now strong move you need to find for white to keep the initiative going. C5, excellent, very good. C5, right? This is the right time to push the spawn because now I'm threatening to play C6. Okay? He takes, I take. Again, I'm threatening to play C6. So he goes rook f8. And now, what do you do now? Bishop, you could do that, but he's going to take, and then f2 is hanging. Okay? So you want to do something better here. Something better. Absolutely. If you have a pass pawn, you continue pushing it. More you push, stronger it's gonna get. Remember that that's the rule when you have a pass pawn. When nothing in front of it, pass pawn, so you push. And it's gonna get stronger, right? So I push. <coughs> he takes only five. I take with the queen because I want to have a centralized queen. Okay? Now my queen is in the center, it's centralized, guarding many squares. And my rooks are on the open file, and I wanna just continue pushing this pawn. And then I have the rook d8 idea as well. So now my opponent took this pawn, and he took the pawn trying to activate. Now what do you do? Push pawn, Push pawn absolutely. You don't stop, you continue pushing it. And now he plays knight g7, trying to defend, but also creating a threat of on f2. See, he wants to take now on f2. Now, what can you do here? Keep pushing that pot now. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> can push it now, now, so we have to defend against his threat, yeah? But it's important you keep the temples. Keep the temples now. Can you defend and attack something? Rook e2. Excellent. Rook e2. Very good. Now we attack the queen, okay? Now he goes queen e6. He's offering the exchange of the queens, and he's hoping that he can neutralize this pawn, but <coughs> it's not going to be easy. So what do I do now? How? Now white is already winning. How? When you have a pawn like this, what's the logical thing to do? Push the rook, right? You push the rook there because you want him to take, right? Yeah. So you can take and queen. That's what you do now. Yeah. Now, I play rook d8, so he takes. I take. And it's possible that my opponent was counting on this move. Because it's not so clear. Because if I take, he takes. <coughs> Maybe he can walk and win the pawn. But this move is very important. After this move, it's going to be clear that white will be winning in a couple of more moves. Very nice move, this one. You need to find. Bishop takes.
See, now he's already threatening to take you. He takes you, you take, he takes it. So he, that's what he's trying to do. So you need to protect that, yeah? What can you do? Well, if I take the bishop, he takes, then I win the knight, but then he takes my pawn. And then it will probably be a draw. I have to make a loft, and it's going to be a draw. Yes? Rook takes the knight. Uh, the problem is he just takes with the bishop. And we can't, even if you move this bishop, you can't still queen because he can take back with the same piece. So... So imagine this, when you exchange these rooks, where do you want this rook to be? Same file. Same file, right? Yeah. So what can you do? There you go. Rook to d5. Now, let's see now what's going to happen. So it looks like a few things he can try to do. He can take the pawn on c7, but now if he takes on d8, you can just take back with the pawn. And you have your rook already protecting it. So he cannot do that. So here, after I played rook ed5, he played bishop b7. We'll look at that move. Uh, but now, if he takes knight takes c7, what do you do? We capture the rook. Capture the rook. And now, <coughs> absolutely. You can go rook up, take the bishop. You can also go rook c5, and you're also winning. You know, actually, rook c5 looks like it might be a little bit more precise. But both moves are winning. So he can actually win my pawn, but at the end he's going to lose a piece. And then he will be clearly down exchange, which is losing. So at this point, when I played knight e6, yeah, this was the basically the, the final, final move that I really needed to find. After this, it's already... Technically, technically winning. So rook e d5, he plays bishop b7. Now, what do you do? Take the rook, Take the rook correct. King takes. Check, Check again. See, like, we always put our rooks on d8, but thanks to this pawn, he can never take it, okay? So that's why, always remember that when you have a pass pawn, you push as much as you can. So now check, and he played king e7. And now, queen, right? We queen, and... <coughs> no. <laughs> Yeah, so now, if he takes, I simply take, and I'm also winning the a-pawn here, okay? Because if he plays a5, I get behind it. And if he goes here, what's the most precise move to win the pawn on a6? Huh? See, because if you just go behind it, he goes knight c7. It's still winning, but... C6, that's C6, oh, yeah? C6, yeah? Yeah, first you attack, because he can go knight C7, C5, you control that. So <laughs> he's going to push, and when he pushes, you get behind it, and you win the pawn, okay? So he played, uh, yeah, he actually, see, he, when I queen, he didn't take, and just a uh, just couple of more moves was played. He took on d8 here, yeah, he took on d8, and I played queen c7 check. There are some positions where you can have a fortress, but uh, not this one, because I also have many pawns. So let's say if I didn't have my pawns, 
there are some positions that you know black can set up a fortress but not when I have my pawns here so he goes king h7 then I simply yeah I guess he just played a couple of more moves and g5 rook g8 check king d7 queen takes g5 and knight e6 was played queen e3 attacking the pawn a6 and after h4 yeah this last five moves are doesn't matter just just this i just start pushing the h pawn he resigned here because not much he can do so again lots of uh, lots of ideas you know in the opening that you see in this uh, sharp uh, gambit where you sacrifice a pawn so but you play you continue playing logically after you created the weaknesses you continue developing your pieces okay the opening of this game again it's martial gambit okay he tried to play the semi slav and i responded with a gambit and remember gambit is when you sacrifice something in the opening usually a pawn it's called a gambit